Okay, hello and welcome to this little pop-up seminar called How Far Can You Get Without Getting Out of Bed? Now, I called it How Far Can You Get Without Getting Out of Bed partly because I have sometimes defended the legitimacy of laziness to people, uh, of reading slowly, of not doing very much, not having a cluttered life. And I thought maybe I should give some rational justification for my laziness uh, as someone who likes to not get out of bed. Uh, I want to talk about how far can you get in terms of insight and understanding just by being in your bedroom. And at the very end of the seminar, I'm hopefully going to come to the at least um, possibility, I'm going to try to convince you that you might be able to learn an incredible amount. In fact, just sitting in your room thinking, you might be able to gain a glimpse into the very nature of reality itself. And that's kind of what speculative philosophy is in a nutshell. Now, the reason why I wanted to chat about this is because I'm currently doing a course online called Find and You Will Seek. And it's a course that looks at the work of Paul Tillich, in particular one of his books. It's his last significant work before he died. In fact, it wasn't even published until after his death. It was a series of lectures he gave in Chicago to law students. That was really an attempt to help uh, those students think about how do you avoid the traps of dogmatism, totalitarianism on one side, and a type of relativism and nihilism on the other. Uh, Tillich saw that these two things are actually intimately interconnected. That relativism, the idea that in science and religion and ethics and philosophy, there is no way to rationally come to some sort of knowledge, to make knowledge claims. All you have is basically a world of different people making incommensurable claims. Um, he says relativism can lead to despotism, can lead to somebody coming in and kind of affirming their will and their desire onto the world. And Tillich is worried about both of these extremes and he is trying to navigate a route between them. And it's a brilliant little book. It's only four chapters long. I'm doing it as an Advent course because Advent is four weeks. And of course, Advent is all about the incoming of the infinite into the finite. So in, in philosophical terms, the advent is all about the hope that truth, the universal, the absolute, what doesn't change, uh, can somehow enter into the finite, into our minds and into the grit and grime of the world. So I, uh, I'm doing it as a kind of advent course. So if you want to do that, let's pay what you want. You can pay as little as one cent for it. Although don't do that unless you're totally broke. <laughs> um, but you can pay as little as you want. And um, that's going on at the moment. But I just basically did a seminar on the first chapter of that book. Uh, well, sorry, the second chapter, uh, which is where Tillich basically deals with relativism head on. Uh, the, the, the second chapter is where he starts to talk about what can we know? What can we have a certain uh, uh, security or certainty about in our lives? And he basically is going to try to undermine relativism. Now, as I'm talking to you, I realize that I forgot to bring in my marker to uh, do stuff on this whiteboard. So please entertain yourself for two seconds while I go into the kitchen and get the marker. Hopefully I can find it quickly. Got it. Okay, sometimes you do need to leave the room. Um, all right, so I'm kind of going to go over what Tillich is doing in this first chapter. So for anybody who's doing the Advent course, this will be a nice summary, hopefully, of that chapter I've just looked at. And for anybody not doing the course, I think this will be an interesting experiment in how philosophy works. And of course, I'm not talking about philosophy as a whole but I'm gonna be talking about a specific type of speculative philosophy that is pretty central to the tradition. Um, now, 
we're going to start with a thinker who is uh, all they're doing is sitting in their room thinking something. And let's say this thinker is thinking that there is nothing you can know. So this thinker is a relativist. Now, a lot of people think that relativism is where philosophy ends. You know, you, you get so far and then you get to a type of radical skepticism and then philosophy kind of crunches to a halt. And maybe in the aftermath of that, you can engage in certain kind of concrete sciences, etc. But philosophy uh, go, comes to silence in front of the truly radical skeptic. So let's take this person as a radical skeptic. They're a teenager in their room questioning everything. This is actually where you could say philosophy begins. Um, now, before I go back to this, I'll just mention three different stages in philosophy, broadly speaking. There is the metaphysical. Um, and the metaphysical tradition of philosophy is really where philosophy attempted to reason out into the world, to kind of make assertions about the very nature of reality itself. Uh, metaphysics means, you know, after physics. So it's like, you know, you've got the physical world, but what grinds the physical world? What can we know about what lies beyond the physical world? And then you have, uh, really with um, Kant, you have the introduction of a truly critical philosophy. And critical philosophy pretty much undermines metaphysical, traditional metaphysical philosophy. Immanuel Kant was saying that the thinker uh, who is trying to think about what lies outside thought in reality, so there's reality, uh, you can't do this. Uh, we are, we can never know being itself, right? We can never know the in itself. We can understand and have a certain uh, appreciation of the world, but we are limited in that. There's something that is inaccessible to us. And Kant is very important in that in terms of the, his development of a critical philosophy that actually gives us a lot of insight into the world. Um, Kant was very interested in the very structures of thought, but he kind of closed the door to us getting to something real out there. And then you have speculative. Uh, speculative philosophy and the person that comes to mind with this is Hegel. And speculative philosophy takes seriously critical philosophy, but it says that pure thinking m might lead us to understanding the nature of reality itself. So metaphysical, if you, if you see scientists today and a lot of people on YouTube uh, who are kind of like a intellectual at some level, they are very critical often of philosophy. And what they're critical of is metaphysical philosophy. So there's definitely a certain skepticism about philosophy that gets us out into the world and helps us understand how things really work. But that was actually done hundreds of years ago, very successfully by Kant. Uh, what happened post Kant is this development of speculative philosophy. And I'm just gonna show you how it works uh, using primarily Paul Tillich and uh, this chapter out of my search for absolutes. So, um, okay, I'll say one more thing. Uh, the reason why someone like Hegel might say that pure thinking can give us access to the real is partly because we are part of everything. We are, as human beings, basically the universe perceiving itself for a moment. We are the universe being able to abstract, being able to sense, itself being able to reflect on itself and so potentially if you get to know yourself if you get to just know the nature of thinking itself you can discover something about the nature of reality itself and we're going to look at how this works so we have this radical skeptic yeah, in their bedroom thinking there is nothing we can do now Tillich starts and goes okay the problem is this position is self-refuting. 
relativism, and most of you will know this, the simple argument that relativism is inconsistent theoretically and practically speaking. Practically speaking, it's impossible because we can't live as true relativists in, in, in the way that we live in the world. We have cares and concerns, we have judgments, we put more value in one thing than another. Uh, so even if we're theoretically relativist, uh, in practice, we have all sorts of value judgments on our, our care and concern for the world um, manifests itself in various ways. But at a theoretical level, the basic argument is, if you are claiming that we can have no insight into the universe, that we have no access to truth, that we can't know anything for sure, that claim is a knowledge claim. And so you're saying, well, there's one thing we can know, we can know that we don't know. And that's a kind of inconsistency. But Tillich wants to expand on that. He doesn't just want to do a cheap parlor trick and go, oh, you know, relativism is, is self-refuting. He wants to go, okay, what can we actually learn from just this question, what can we know? And Tillich starts off by, he could actually name six things. And the first is called sense impressions. So, um, sense impressions are basically whatever you experience in the world. Consciousness, as Sartre says, is always consciousness of something. You experience red, you experience blue, you experience heat, you experience coldness. Uh, all sorts of sense impressions uh, make their impact in your subjectivity. And while you cannot know for sure where they come from, you can't deny that you're experiencing them. So you can't deny that your mind is full of all sorts of things. Right now, my mind is full of uh, uh, mobile phone, computer, camera, bed, TV. There's all of these things that are making their impressions upon me. And there's all sorts of colors. And while I can, like uh, Descartes, Descartes in a thought experiment said, what if there was a demonic, all-powerful being who made sure that at every moment of my life I was deceived? Is there anything I could know? So let's just imagine there is this all-powerful demonic figure ruling the universe. And that demonic figure is making sure that everything that you know is actually a type of deception. This demon is just trying to mess with your head all the time. Well, Tillich is saying that, okay, you still can't deny the sense impressions. You may not actually be seeing a red fire engine, but you're experiencing a red fire engine. Right? There's no denying that. So there's a weird sense of a very small bit of knowledge is you can be sure of your sense impressions because they are happening within you. I mean, that's not very much, but it's something, right? So we're starting to open up just purely by thinking we've already found one thing that we can be pretty sure about. Second thing is logic, right? The moment you say, we can't know anything, you are relying upon a logical system. You're making a logical argument. You're making a claim. And so the very ability to think presupposes a logical structure, just like in language. You don't think about grammatical rules in everyday language, you just speak. But you couldn't speak if those grammatical rules were not working and operating beneath the surface. So there's a whole pile of rules within language that we're basically not aware of unless you study linguistics, uh, semiotics or whatever. But they are at work every time you speak. And in the same way, there is a whole set of logical uh, structures that pre-exist all of your arguments that have to be presupposed whenever you make any argument whatsoever. And so even though we can argue about what those logical structures are, as soon as we speak, we are assuming them. So we have a basic uh, knowledge that there has to be some sort of underlying logic that we are operating with. And then for Tillich, the third one is a sense of self. And this brings us back to Descartes in many ways, that if you say, I don't think there is meaning to anything, I don't think there's anything we can know, the very fact that you're using the word I uh, shows that you have a sense of selfhood. Now again, that 
might be substantive, it might be a type of illusion, but you still have a sense of self. You have a sense of center, centeredness, and that is not something that you can deny. In the very act of speaking, of engaging with the world, you are assuming a center, a centered self of some kind. And in all of these, we can argue about how to actually parse them out, but we, in order to argue about them, have to presuppose them. So okay, that's kind of interesting. Um, so we've got, we haven't got very far not being, you know, not getting out of bed, but we've got somewhere. The next one is essences, and this is where it gets a bit deeper. Uh, my spelling is always terrible, so if I spell something wrong, forgive me. Um, essences is interesting, because Tillich now is saying, okay, not only do you experience red things, I see a red fire engine, I see a red house or um, a red face, or there's some red in the picture that I'm looking at just behind this camera. I see red things, but also I can perceive redness. And redness is different from red things. Red things exist, they are things that exist in the world, even if it's just the world of my mind, right? There are, there are beings, these, these red things. But redness doesn't exist. Redness is an, an abstraction, it is an idea, a platonic idea, uh, and that's basically what an essence is. An essence doesn't kind of exist in the same way as other things in the universe. It is a type of abstraction. So again, you can think of lots of circles. There are many circles in the world, but no circle is perfect. No matter how carefully I draw a circle, it's not gonna be a perfect circle. But I can abstract into the notion of a perfect circle. Uh, in mathematics, I can think of, construct a perfect circle uh, just purely in a, as a mathematical formula. That's a type of essence or abstraction. And for Tillich, this is vitally important. This is the nature of language. For Tillich, language has two dimensions, communication and abstraction. Communication is what other animals have. To communicate is simply to be able to take an idea or a feeling and uh, relate to something else or someone else. Fear, anger, threat, whatever. But language for Tillich really comes into its own with, with the ability to abstract, to talk, to talk not just about cats, right? You don't just experience one or two cats in the world, but then to be able to talk about cats in general. So that every, if every cat in the universe was taken away, there would still be the concept of cat, the essence of cat would remain. Um, so that's essences. And this is kind of like Tillich talks about how we have evolved so quickly when for a long time we were at the same evolutionary level as say chimpanzees. What is it that enabled us to get to a point where we could create cities and civilizations? And uh, Tillich talks about how it's really at the point where we were able to develop abstraction through potentially you know, the, the, the increase of our brain size, which might have been connected to better food sources, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, so that's essences we can essentialize. I can talk about, uh, Tillich says, not just a pine tree. There's not just a tree, it's a pine tree. I can talk about pine trees, the species of pine trees. And then I can talk about the genus of, genus of trees, which are different from houses, et cetera, et cetera. Very simple thing, but actually you require it in order to think. Again, all of these are required in order to be a relativist. Right. Then the next one uh, is ontological structures, um, and this is this is a very deep and difficult one that brings up the work of uh, Manuel Kant. Ontological structures. Tillich lists four of them. There's four different structures, and each of these structures have a multiple uh, number of categories within them, a number of kind of subdivisions. The first, the first one, the first ontological structure is what he calls categories. And the categories are uh, things like cause and effect, substance, um, quantity and quality, right? These are categories. And uh, so we'll take, um, what was the first one I mentioned? Uh, there's, well, take cause and effect, right? You cannot think without presupposing cause and effect. Cause and effect is something that is in operation all around us. And even if, again, if it's just in our minds, 
one thing follows another, one thing impacts another. There are different types of cause and effect. There's logical cause and effect, two plus two equals four. Um, and there is a physical cause and effect, one billiard ball hits another billiard ball and it moves. But these all presuppose cause and effect. If you took cause and effect out of the universe, our universe would collapse, our world would dissolve. And by world, um, that's a good thing to define. What we mean by world is not just the planet. The world is uh, any unified center. So you can talk about the world of Dungeons and Dragons, the world of YouTube, the world of biology. These are different worlds. And we, we exist in, ver in a variety of worlds. But worlds would collapse if cause and effect stopped operating. Substance is the same. Substance means it, you are something, you know, that you have consistency. So in, uh, Tillich talks about Kafka when he, when he writes in Metamorphosis about a guy, he becomes a cockroach, right? Basically where substance dissolves away, where we can be one thing and then another. And, and there is no substantive uh, sense of self. If that began to disintegrate in the world, again, our world would disintegrate. And horror movies play on this. Horror movies play on the disintegration of categories where cause and effect don't seem to operate. Substance can, can, can dissolve. Uh, also quantity, numbers. We think in terms of, you know, one, two, five, ten, right? If we didn't have a sense of quantity, quantities of things, our world would dissolve. So first one is categories. Uh, and there's, there's lots of them. Uh, the second is, let me see, oh, perceptions. Uh, and perceptions basically is space and time. You cannot think without, spe without assuming space and time. We are not just beings, we are beings in the world. We are beings that inhabit a world and inhabit a time. And uh, so again, if you say, I am a, I'm a relativist, I don't believe in anything. In order to make that claim, you have to assume time and space. That's a biggie. <laughs> uh, then there is, let me see, uh, categories, perceptions. Um, there's the transcendentals. Um, oh yeah, there's the, uh, what, did, what, did, what would you call them? Um, what do you call them? I wonder if I've got it written down. Uh, okay, I, for, I forget the term for it, but basically it is, um, uh, let's call it binary systems. Um, it's just the name has slipped my mind, but you'll understand what it is in a second. It's, I call it binary systems here, for want of the better word, because uh, it this is about binaries that we live within uh, as individuals. Uh, so you've got things like dynamic and form. You've got freedom and destiny. You've got individuation and participation. So what do all of these mean? Well, it means that to be a self, to have a self, to have a world, you need to operate between dynamics, which is movement, and form, which is structure. If everything was pure form, there would be no movement, there'd be no thinking or anything like that. If everything was pu pure dynamics with no substance, then there'd just be pure chaos. There would be no ability to construct anything. So to be human is to assume, we assume dynamics and form. If we're, again, the relativist who says, I don't believe anything, you can only say that in a universe that has dynamics and form. Uh, individuation and participation is, you have a sense of selfhood, individ individuality, but also you participate in a world, in a language. So language is basically participation with others. There's no such thing as a private language. Uh, to, again, to make any claim, like I am a relativist, you, you can only make that claim within this uh, sliding scale between individuation and participation. And the same is with um, freedom and destiny. Destiny is a sense in which we are influenced by and controlled by our environment. Uh, we are products of our environment. But freedom is the sense in which 
our movement and our decisions within the world come from a center. So they feel like they're not purely the result of uh, movement of cause and effect, but are, but are centered in a sense of subjectivity. And again, wh whatever you believe about those ideas, any claim whatsoever kind of presupposes this binary structure. And then last is the transcendentals. Uh, the transcendentals um, are basically these medieval concepts of the true and the good. Uh, again, no matter what you think about what the true or the good is, we can't operate without them. I suppose, again, the relativist who maybe is talking about relativism, they are making a claim that knowledge is, is good, that they're making a claim that, that uh, that is better than the other claims that exist in the world, right? So there's a, a hierarchy that's being presupposed that you can't kind of do anything but presuppose. So what we have here then is sense impressions, logic, uh, sense of self, essences, ontological structures, and then finally, probably the most controversial one uh, is Tillich says that we have just purely by thinking a uh, what would you call it, entry into being itself. Now being in itself is a difficult philosophical term, but beings are everything that you see. Everything that you see that exists is a being of some kind. Even Sherlock Holmes is a being. It's just a fictional character, but he's a being. Santa Claus, computers. The universe is full of beings. Being itself um, is, is kind of what all of those share in common. Um, for Tillich, what everything shares in common, at first sounds strange, everything shares in common uh, that it isn't nothing. So being is not nothing. <clears throat> there you go, it's most basic. What, is, what, what, what do I share in common with the sofa? That we are not nothing. Uh, what do I share in common with Sherlock Holmes? Well, we are not nothing. Of course, Sherlock Holmes is nothing in one sense, but uh, also he is something in another sense. So being in its most abstract for Paul Tillich is everything is a type of courage to be. Everything is a type of proclamation of being, of existence, of standing out against nothingness itself. So before the universe was created, if you think of the metaphor of beyond the, the, the Big Bang, there is nothing. And then out of nothing explodes beings, billions upon billions upon billions of beings. And each of these beings is a type of detour between nothingness and nothingness. Each of those beings is, a, is an amen, is a, is a type of protest against what Tillich calls the threat of non-being. And Tillich says there's two ways in which we feel being itself. So we're not just we are a being in the world walking around, but we somehow interconnect and feel feel something that unifies everything, right? And this is where Tillich gets a bit kind of druggy, right? If you talk to any people who use ayahuasca and stuff, this is the type of experience they, they have. It's also called philosophical love. So philosophers talk about it, mystics talk about it, uh, people within the drug community talk about it. It is, the, the negative side um, is the threat of non-being. So whenever your life is under threat uh, in some in some way, right? You nearly die, you find out you've got a terminal illness, uh, whatever. When you experience the threat of non-being, you, in a negative way, often in a very traumatic way, you feel the protest of being itself. You feel you're kind of at one with everything. You, you experience, you become aware of the fact that you're not nothing. You, of course, you're, every day you're not nothing, but you become aware of it. You become aware of it very abstractly, not just that you are under threat of non-being, but you connect with the threat of non-being itself. And then positively, and this is the druggy bit, is um, the experience in which you look around, maybe you go for a walk in the park, maybe you uh, go on a holiday and you know just are contemplating life, and you look around and very briefly you get a sense of the 
the affirmation of everything and this is called love but it's not romantic love it's called philosophical love or there's other names for it but it's a love for everything <laughs> it's a love and it's not really a love for everything it's a love for the fact that everything affirms existence that everything that is says we are and that probably is a bit waffly but um but Tillich is saying that just purely before you get out of bed <laughs> you can have this experience of the affirmation of life, the courage of being, um, that, that permeates the universe. So there you go, that has, you've got quite far, um, and it goes further and further. There is even the possibility that philosophy, like pure thinking, can actually get you further than um, even kind of like concrete sciences. Although concrete sciences are very platonic. Like you take Newton, Newton's idea of motion, right, where a body that is at rest will stay at rest unless a force moves on it. Um, and then a, a body that is in movement will stay in movement unless a force acts upon it. Now, the interesting thing there is we never see that. That's a type of essence. That doesn't exist in the world. No, there is no body that is not acted upon in some sort of way. That's a regulative ideal. That is a that is an essence, that um, that you know we kind of make observations in the world and then we abstract to that kind of notion, or take um, mathematics, like in math in pure mathematics, you can potentially it is the language of the universe itself. A mathematician writing in their office uh, might be able to gain greater insights into the very reality of nature itself because they are part of nature, because thought is part of everything. Um, this is what Heidegger is doing in his famous book, Being and Time. He, he wants to talk about what is being, and he starts off by saying, well, what is the one being that we have access to? Well, it's ourselves, our own subjectivity, our own mind. And so the journey is not out experimenting in the world. It's what's called, it's a priori, which is prior to experience. It is a delving deep into the very structure of the mind itself in a way that can give us deep insight into all sorts of practical things. Actually, I mean, uh, uh, Herbert Dreyfus was famous for giving a critique of AI that was saying that the AI at the time, I think this is around the 1960s, which was trying to basically get computers to be artificially intelligent through giving them a huge amount of rules of what to do in a given situation. So if you want to teach a car to drive, you just give it millions of rules. And with enough rules, it will have enough complexity to be able to intelligently interact with the world. And Herbert Dreyfus, just using the work of Heidegger, uh, was able to, I think, very convincingly uh, show that this, this understanding of AI is a uh, is never going to get us anywhere and uh, you know helped to put AI onto a different course and that uh, is definitely worth reading if you're interested in that stuff but okay so that is one way of thinking about speculative philosophy it is my defense of being lazy uh, of saying that a mere thought one mere thought can open up an entire world and uh, that's kind of an interesting thing you can go on a big journey um, just purely in the intellectual life if you're interested in more of this, I recommend you get the book, My Search for Absolutes. Uh, it's very, very good. Uh, you can get it very cheap usually, and um, it's got these really cool illustrations by a guy called Saul, um, uh, is it Salzburg? I forget his name, but, uh, but a friend of Tillich who's a, who's a illustrator. And uh, yeah, it's definitely, um, definitely worth getting. So thanks very much for checking in and I hope you got something out of it. Oh, maybe I should look, see if you've got any questions. Let me do that. Okay. Uh, Aaron says, it seems like we resurrected metaphysics. How precisely does Tillich's metaphysics escape Kant's critique? Maybe I missed that. Well, yeah, what I would say is no, uh, Tillich is very much in the speculative tradition and he's very critical of metaphysics. So Tillich is very influenced by the German idealists. And so what Tillich is trying to do is, the difference is in metaphysical speculation, traditional metaphysical speculation, the mind can get you out into the world. So there is metaphysical realities that are out there that you can get to. 
the critique of metaphysics is obviously the critique of that idea that there is an in itself that we cannot grasp. And then the speculative tradition is that thinking can get us to get, can give us insight into being in itself, not because we get outside of our mind, but because our mind is within being itself. <laughs> so uh, Tillich is very much, he, he's very uh, sympathetic to the traditional uh, philosophical enterprise of kind of knowing, but he's very much in the speculative tradition rather than the metaphysical tradition. Let me see, <laughs> where'd you get your sweater? I got this in Brooklyn, not in Ireland, funnily enough. I, I have some good sweaters from Ireland, but this one I got I got in New York whenever I lived. I lived just outside New York for many years, uh, and that's one of my favourites. <laughs> I think I should do this one like philosophical question and then one kind of just kind of very off the wall question. Let me see what else is being said. Unfortunately, I can't see all the questions. I can only see four at a time. That's kind of annoying. Why is that? I'm going to try and fix that. Let me see. Uh, oh no, that's that's a bit annoying. Literally every time the comments come up, they move and I can only see four at a time. So um, I don't know if I can fix that. Ah, let me try. Um, okay, Amanda, because another one came up. Uh, hey Amanda, this seems to assume a normative order for humanity. For what do, what do we do with those who are disordered in mind? Well, this is a this is a great question because it does bring us to some like some contemporary issues that are happening in the world at the moment. Uh, classical philosophy uh, seems a bit out of touch with the current climate because, but that's exactly why Tillich is writing this book. He is worried because he's talking about he's talking to these students, these law students, and he sees in the future. He's, this is his, he's right at the end of his life. He's about to die, he knows he's about to die. At the end of the first chapter, he says, my work has come to an end. He's basically handing over the baton. And at the end of his work, he's going, I see a time where relativism is going to be the water within which a student swim. And he says, and I think that that relativism will open the door to a type of totalitarianism. And so he's, he's warning the students that, that by giving up the sense of reason, you're opening the doors up to a type of new totalitarianism. Now, but, so he, he, he does want to say that this is the essence of thinking itself. There is, um, you, these, these structures, these ontological structures, et cetera, et cetera, are there for everybody. And, you know, you're talking about kind of like someone who is, say, has kind of mental health issues, which is like a huge number of us. But still, these structures are there and in place. Um, for someone who's suffering from psychosis, maybe, I mean, you could say that what's happening is when the psychotics were, like you have a psychotic break, something of your ontological structures are cracking, um, you know, or your sense of self. So within psychosis, the sense of self is, is uh, under threat. So psychotic individuals have problems with, uh, they have out of body experiences, uh, fractured sense of self, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not even that Tillich is saying that these, um, I suppose he's not saying that these hold for everybody, but when they begin to dissolve, our very, our world dissolves. And you see that within psychosis is whenever substance disappears, where people don't have a sense of a stable universe. Again, what happens is the, the beginning of the dissolution of the world. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think you could probably look at these categories and connect them with psychoanalytic ideas. I'd have to think about that. But re regardless of, uh, um, you know, whether you who are listening agree or disagree, I guess what I want to just say is that Tillich is wanting to fight against the notion that all we have is incommensurable worlds where people cannot communicate between each other because of, you know, we don't share the same experiences. What Tillich is saying is that underlying everybody, whether in 10 billion years time or in the past or anything, human beings, as long as you're able to use language, you have to assume all of this stuff. So, um, so very much classical philosophy, really. 
Okay, still can't see any more comments. Very sorry about that. I wish I, um, I'll maybe try and look into how to actually uh, see all of your comments at one time. But thanks for checking in. Uh, I hope this little pop-up lecture was interesting on your Saturday morning. And um, uh, I'll, I'll maybe try and do a few more of these. But say, if you're interested, get the book, My Search for Absolutes. Uh, check out the course, find and you will seek, which is on my website. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye.